So I'll talk about something I've spent the last 12 years, uh, well, all the time since I came to Oslo in 1998. I've come back to the problem of pressure solution and I've trying, been trying to understand some of it. And together with Jean-Pierre Gratier and François Renard, we <coughs> were trying to mm, write a review on this to kind of uh, at least see where see where we stand. And, uh, it's been it's uh, a little bit interesting because uh, at least some people keep bugging me with questions about well what what do we actually know about this part of pressure solution or what do we know there and and I found out I cannot always answer. So <clears throat> now I'll try to. I'll try to tell you what I think is as much as anyone can answer some of your questions of on pressure solution. Um, so pressure solution or it sometimes also called solution precipitation creep. It's an deformation mechanism that's uh, important in several parts of the Earth, Earth's crust. And it operates by mm, dissolving under stress and, and diffusive mass, mass transport mm, in a liquid and precipitation in regions of smaller stress. <coughs> so mm, the traditional name is pressure solution, as I said, and but uh, uh, Several authors like the other solution precipitation creep because it kind of says more about what actually goes on. Now, as this guy. Now, here we've got two grains that have been, I think these are quartz grains that have been uh, pressing onto each other for God knows how long. And we can see that one is indenting into the other. And this is in cross polarizer, so you can more easily see the differences between the two grains. And you can see the differences between what seems to have been overgrowth on this grain and on this grain, and the same hair as well. So, what's we deduce has happened is that this red, what is shown in red is material that has been removed from, from these two grains and they've been transported out to region where there is, there were, where there was originally not such, no grains connecting and the same material has been deposited next to it. So <clears throat> it's dissolution under high stress, transport and precipitation under low stress. And when you've got lots of grains and, uh, and man many small changes like this, it adds up to a deformation of the, mm, of the grain aggregate. So, uh, for for the physicist, this is quite important in in, in sediment. It produces you you take rubble that is goes to the bottom of the ocean and is in, has more and more rubble on and sediments on top of it, and it gets pressed together, and it becomes in the end you can take it out and it's actually what used to be loose aggregate uh, loose aggregates becomes in a rock that is mm, much denser and sticks to where the grains actually stick together. One mm, nice curious feature mm, of this process is these wiggly lines here that you often find in um, mm, after compaction of sediments like this. They're called stylolites, so it just means writing in stone, or uh, loosely said. And this is an instability in, in this compaction process that is not really understood yet. Uh, we've spent some time 
Francois has spent a lot of time mapping these, and and uh, here is is taken two parts um, f away from each other, and this is what a, a dissolution plane that um, um, looks like from the top. And looking at perpendicularly at it, you've got these um, lines like this. Um, it's a localization of compaction uh, that we have tried to do with drinking straws in the lab. Uh, that This is the closest anyone has ever got to presenting experimental, experimentally something looking, mm, an instability looking a bit like mm, the style lights, but there are many features lacking. So nobody has ever reproduced them experimentally. There are some modeling done on it, but they make a lot of assumptions. Pressure solution is also important for nuclear waste rubble like this, because you're interested in knowing what mm, what actually happens to your grain boundaries in salt caves where where they are hidden, and mm, and these mm, these grain boundaries they deform under pressure solution, and it's imp important for the integrity of waste disposals like this. Now. <clears throat> I said something about the ductility of the upper crust. The, um, normally we think of the upper crust as being brittle. That's why we have earthquakes. Uh, but there are mm, a number of features that show that they are, mm, that the, mm, the upper crust can be ductile as well. One, one uh, thing, uh, one process linked to um, earthquakes where pressure solution is important is that when you when you have had an earthquake zone where where the rock has been crushed and these are simulations by Karen Karen Mer, then then the the rocks are crushed into smaller pieces and and these small pieces, they actually deform and heal together by the process of pressure solution and, and uh, crack healing. So that this, the, def the period between earthquakes, the strengthening of the fault gouge, is very much uh, controlled by pressure solution. Uh, the... <clears throat> there are also some clearly ductile structure that mm, geologists tell me are formed in the upper crust, like this this fo mm, folding here. And then the question is, when when does the rock mm, deform ductally like this, and mm, and what is the rheology? Also in um, in metals. Mm, one knows mm, one has one can deform metals plastically, and in some cases when um, they've got they call something super plasticity when they can extend an original mm, metal piece like this to more than I think it's five times its original length or something then they call it super plasticity not only plasticity and this can only be performed when through the process of dissolution and transport along the grain boundaries and reprecipitation on the grain boundaries. So actually some of some of the best simulations on uh, on processes mm, this type of process, which is actually exactly the same as the pressure solution process, has been performed mm, in physics for metal type systems. Um, okay, so now a little bit more details about uh, about the process itself. The driving force for pressure solution is that you have a stress and that there is a higher chemical, there is a chemical potential difference between this region where there is a large normal stress and 
other regions where there are lower normal stress. So there is a chemical potential difference between here and there, which drives mass transfer from this, from here to there. And actually, it is possible to have the other, the opposite, um, the opposite process, which uh, Anya has spent some time studying, where you, you start out with this fluid not being in equilibrium with, with uh, the, the grains, but being supersaturated so that you have a, a solution that it has a much higher chemical potential, also higher than the chemical potential inside here. And, th and then you will grow both inside and outside, and, it, in, and this because of the larger chemical potential, you can set up a stress and actually push up mm, and, and do a work against mm, the environment. So in this case, the environment is doing work on these, mm, these grains. In this case, this grain boundary is doing work on the environment. Now, as you'll see in this one, I've, even though I've, I've um, said that there is contact, there is a stress. I've all the time I've been drawing con a, a continuous fluid phase. Here. This is to indicate that that uh, we have reasons to believe that there is during this process always a fluid phase present even when there is a normal stress, even mm, mm, at the interface. And it is possible to, to, to explain it to some extent, because when you have two, two surfaces in contact, then there are different, mm, the most important forces are the electrostatic forces and van der Waals forces where van der Waals forces tend to pull them together, pull the two surfaces together, so, and the electrostatic forces push them apart. And the, so the, these are the uh, interaction energies, and the, the pressure acting on the two surfaces, that's the um, derivative of, the negative derivative of these um, these curves. So the total potential will be negative in this area and, and so it will tend to draw the surfaces together when you're in a certain region here. Here it's the, the flank is positive so they are being pushed apart and so there is actually a net force pushing the, the two surfaces apart before they are in real contact. So at some, some, mm, a few nanometers distance, they are, mm, the two surfaces are being pushed apart and there is room for a liquid in between. If you get close enough, you, you will get into this, this region where they will really stick together as grain boundaries without any fluid. And so, with an, so a very nice apparatus called the surface forces apparatus, they have measured uh, the force as a fu function of distance between two surfaces, and they can actually see that see oscillations that cor are supposed to correspond to single layers of water being expulsed between these surfaces as you get closer. And, and you can see that the net effect is that there is a large repulsion and that you can have a, a, fl a thin fluid layer between two surfaces even if there is even if there is a net force to them. So this means that the fluid in between here has its it's it has a different pressure from the fluid outside. So if you have a fluid in contact with this fluid here at the fluid pressure PF, then the fluid pressure inside will be much higher, but even though it's a fluid, it will not be expelled. You know, 
the definition of a fluid is that it cannot sustain shear forces. But in this, in this case, it does contain, sustain shear forces. And, and, but we do think it is fluid. We know that there is diffusion going on. There have been measurements on this. So th this is kind of the basis for, for the fast matter transport out of the region where there is, mm, where dissolution is happening. If there was no fluid there, if, if you get to this situation, the diffusion rate out of such a grain contact will be many orders of magnitude slower. And then pressure solution would have been a much slower process and less efficient and uh, it would not be possible to uh, compact sediments until you until you got much deeper and you could um, plastically deform the grains. Now, um, a few words about a little bit more detail about the driving force of pressure solution. Um, the way I've always thought it's simplest to think about it is that you, when you've got a, originally a grain like this, you are pressing upon it with some other grains on the other side, and you're deforming it into this new grain here. Then you are moving matter from there to there, so you are mm, performing work on it. The work equals the Volume, mm, the volume times mm, times the stress difference mm, here, and and this is the this corresponds to the main driving force of pressure solution. The main difference in in uh, the work term is the most important driving force for for pressure solution. It's just the partial molar volume times the difference in in stress of the two phases. Um, <clears throat> now, we'll see that mm, if we go into more detail, we see that the, there is a ke solid chemical potential that, and, and a liquid chemical potential, and the, the, the difference drives the dissolution. The difference between this, the chemical potential in the liquid here and liquid there, drives the transport. And the difference between the chemical potential in the liquid and the solid drives the precipitation. <clears throat> but so that in total, what's mm, in total all you have to know about is the difference in, in chemical potential of the solid on this phase and this phase. These are just intermediates. <clears throat> So this is just what I said. The, these are the driving forces for, for the three different steps of the, of the process. And, and in, for different materials, different, different steps are in the rate limiting. Like for quartz is a very is a material that dissolves very slowly. Mm, you can be mm, quartz is very mm, very far from equilibrium at the earth mm, mm, surface of the earth. You've got water with no quartz flowing over it, and still it will take an enormous long time to dissolve these glass windows or or mm, quartz in nature, and that's because the dissolution takes a much longer time. Now, th this in looking at this three-step process, we can then say, well, the mm, the important thing is this mm, this dissolution mm, step. The mm, what is limiting the rate is the dissolution step. Everything else has time to equilibrate, so that we mm, all the others are. Mm, mm, are mm, all the other chemical potentials are the same, and the the driving, the driving force for the dissolution is, in fact, the total difference in 
chemical potential from there to there. For salts like sodium chloride, sodium chlorate, that we like to use in the lab for, mm, for experiments, and also maybe in some, some situations for gypsum and calcite and, uh, and other materials in the Earth's crust. Then what is limiting, mm, limiting the, the rate of the whole process is the diffusion out through this thin liquid layer. In this case, as before, the, mm, this, the, you will quickly equilibrate these two chemical potentials and these two, and the, whole, and the driving force is the total driving force. For calcites and quartz, we know of some situations where impurities um, hinder precipitation. That's, mm, you've got, uh, there are sedimentary basins mm, where, mm, where mm, there is porosity at a depth where e everybody expect, expected it to be closed down by pressure solution a long time ago. And they found that all the surfaces were coated by mm, chloride that inhibits the precipitation so that you, you dissolve as, mm, as much as you can and you transport it out and it's sitting in the pore space but it, you can't get rid of it. Um, and the same way there, the, the driving force is given by the, the total. So the, this is a nice sim a simplification that is good to do in nature. Now, oh, that was an ugly symbol. I, I've, uh, I will bore you with a couple of more equations be because it's, it, the reason is that it's got to do with is the question of is pressure solution in, does it give effectively a Newtonian rheology or a nonlinear rheology? This means, it, this funny symbol here uh, is uh, transferring from Mac to uh, Windows of uh, strain rate, so it's strain with a dot on top of it. It's supposed to be strain rate, these two. Um, now, <coughs> going, th going through the, the literature, I was amazed to see that some people say that uh, that strain rate is proportional to stress difference and some people say that strain rate is proportional to the exponential of the stress difference and and then well they, those who use this one they say well mm, when stress is small um, then it, it linearizes to this form but they mm, nobody has actually done what I always teach my students to do is, which is if you say something is small, you have to compare it to something. Small to co small compared to what? And, and and actually, I've never seen a good comparison telling me how small is small. So th these are just two starting points. In irreversible thermodynamics, you will always say that the. Mm, your flux is proportional to your driving force times a linear coefficient. Well, directly out from this starting point, you get that your, mm, your strain rate is proportional to your flux, is proportional to, mm, to your stress, so it's linear. If you start with transition state theory, which is a nice word for just mm, for what physicists know as uh, uh, jump prob probabilities, it's uh, mm, you have an activation barrier and uh, you have mm, two different states, and you have mm, the probability of jumping in one direction or the other, and the, in the other direction is proportional to the Boltzmann factor of, of jumping. So it's proportional. And then it's very simple to show that you end up with a pre-factor which contains the, which contains the 
size of the activation barrier and and you get mm, an exponential with the mm, with the difference in in uh, mm, energy of the two two sides so in this mm, in this case mm, in th with these assumptions you it is proportional to the exponential of the stress difference now this looks like what it would be called a nonlinear rheology. Uh, now, when when is this? Uh, when can we linearize? Well, if we just look at these numbers, it means that for quartz, for example, for stress differences of the order of 0.1 gigapascal, the mm, you will the linear form will be within a factor of two. Um, I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, there seems to be a um, piece of work yet to be done here to actually look at what what is the relation between these two because they they should it should be possible to look at what are the assumptions you do here of detailed balance which should actually be in, inside this one and see where is. Is this the pertinent place to ask the question of what is small and not, or should it be done inside the statistical mechanical theory? But that's to be done yet for some for someone. So that w that was the part on dissolution kinetics. Um, on transport kinetics, I've been saying well the. What mm, limits us is that this is a very thin film. It's one to maybe as much as 10 nanometer thick film of water. So that mm, you don't have a big cross section to, mm, to transport your mass out. But observations and theory suggest that this film does not, this uh, grain boundary region does not always remain flat. It does mm, become rough or mm, makes mm, what is called an island channel structure or mm, there are different models for, for the structure mm, of this and there has been observations. Um, there have been se several types of observations mm, after mm, doing pressure solution experiments or in nature you take them apart and you look you map out Mm, what used to be the grain boundary that was active in pressure solution, and and you s there are clearly observations that mm, there is often a roughness. Now, this in this case we are talking about one to ten nanometers. In this case, there are channels that mm, of the order of one to ten micrometers, which is three orders of magnitude larger. And so that you can transport much faster out of such a network than there. So there, mm, there has been the last 15 years a lot of work on trying to understand both theoretically, mm, experimentally and in the field. How, can we actually predict, can we understand why it becomes unstable? Why does it roughen? Why doesn't it just become flat? And and when does it go from being flat or with with a fluid in between into being fused together? Because <clears throat> when you have such a as if you remember the, the most stable state, if you are able to press the the two surfaces completely together, you gain in energy. If you remember this um, energy diagram where the, dis the distance between the two, the two mm, grains and then it looked something like this. This is the, in the energy between mm, of this interface. If you are able to to push them past this one, then you have a lot of energy to to gain 
in, in actually expelling all the water. So that clearly this is the thermodynamically the most stable situation. And in, in nature, we see lots of former fluid-filled fill, regions that are now only have lots of fluid inclusions left on them. They have closed up, but have some fluids trapped on them. These are some ex mm, pictures from experiments that Francois did here in Oslo s quite a few years ago, where we studied the dynamics of of this contact healing process where he f filled some cracks in a gel and just the elastic energy and surface energy mm, started pushing back the, the oil inside the gel and mm, pushing it back out, out of the gel and what was left with such a network that ended up like with lots of small pearls as you find in nature. And looking at these structures that I showed you that we know are pressure, mm, pressure solution contacts, to me, some of this looks quite similar to, to a, mm, what has been, was a fu fluid film, mm, was to a grain boundary with fluid in it, but which has expelled fluid and that now has, real, has had real contact and when I say a real contact, that means there is no more fluid, that you have atomic bonds directly from one solid to the other, and which also means that dissolution and transport becomes much, much more difficult, so at least five orders of mag magnitude slower. So. If this happens to a grain boundary, then it stops the whole process of pressure solution. It just closes it down. Um, yeah, and I'll just end by saying that a hundred years of pressure solution research has focused completely on only the three step process dissolution, precipit no, transport, precipitation. And there has been a little bit of discussion, but mm, we've never really discussed the implications of, well, what actually happens if, if all, if the grain boundaries start healing? How does this, if mm, you've got an aggregate with a million interfaces and then an, uh, a network of them starts healing, meaning that they, the process of pressure solution is closed down and it, and it stops. And then, that's why um, I've, I've been looking a bit at the consequences of such an arrest of the um, process of pressure solution. This curve by Mr. Athey, maybe is a doctor, I'm not sure, uh, from 1930 is quite famous. It's, I think it's one of the first depth, uh, uh, this is, no, th this is density depth curves for, mm, from borehole logs in, in many different uh, reservoirs. And af after this, many people have been making correlations like this, where you see you see all these data plots that seem to mm, seem to show a mm, trend of a mapping between or a, a, a curve that relates depth to density. So it means that, and one people have said that all, mm, that this is the typical curve for the smooth curve is due to pressure solution. Now there's just one problem is, and that's pressure, pressure solution is a viscous rheology. It has time in it. So that if you leave it at some depth, 
there is a, a, there is a differential stress and it will change through time. So that if you compare different reservoirs that have different ages, you shouldn't have a depth, a, a common depth mm, density mm, uh, curve. They should be different because the time is different. But if this curve is due to pressure solution, it means that there is some relation be between time and depth, which uh, seems, seems strange for the different reservoirs. Now, uh, some of you may have seen this picture during Bjorn's talk at the, um, at the uh, board's meeting last time, where we ended up looking at something similar. This is chalk at different depths. And the first thing I saw when, when we saw this one was that why are there so small features in something that's been lying there for millions and millions of years? Just the surface energy of these small grains should have driven them to recrystallize in a process called Oswald ripening. So there is clearly there is something that is hindering this chalk in doing its normal dissolution reprecipitation process. And Peter Japsen, he had some logs. These hole drawn here are, are logs of effective depth, meaning stress, or differential stress on the vertical axis, and porosity on this axis. And he found that there was a region where there was a jump, a discontinuity, that doesn't look like this this curve that uh, ev everyone has been ex expecting. Now, I, I don't understand this curve, but uh, no one uh, <laughs> no one understood this uh, discontinuity, and it turns out that it's due to the arrest of pressure solution by a bi biological film on, out on the mm, calcite grains. So in this case, it's been arrested by a bi biological film, and when you get to a certain depth, you start microfracturing it, opening up new surface that can be attacked by, mm, by dissolution and thereby by pressure solution, and suddenly you start compacting very fast again. So that's Yes, it is true that there is pressure solution that is the effective mechanism of bringing material from stressed sites to unstressed sites and thereby deforming the aggregate. But the, mm, the, there is no longer a time dependence as we're used to. The, mm, actually, the, the, mm, th this process is so fast that it's almost instantaneous on the geological time scale. So that what is actually controlling it is the depth. So maybe that is what is going on here. That, that due to closing down of the pressure solution process by contact healing, then you, then it's only when you get to lower depths that you are ripping up some of these closed, these healed contacts, and you can reactivate pressure, sol pressure solution for some time. So that even though the active process of deformation is in fact pressure solution, it's no longer time dependent, but stress dependent. So it's no longer a vi viscous deformation but it's a plastic deformation. This is still just a hypothesis. It's open for anyone to check or work on. So that's, my hypo that's the hypothesis that the existence of such curves is due to contact healing. And we get plastic and not viscous in rheology. Um, I had a small question mark here. I checked with Dani today, and yes, uh, such ductile structures can very well exist without having um, nonlinear rheologies. 
but uh, Dani and Stefan and others have been, and uh, Ray Fletcher have been working on what they call pinch and swell structures, which they say they need power law mm, rheologies or strongly nonlinear rheologies in order to um, to form. And, and that's why mm, Stefan has been asking me over and over again the question, is pressure solution linear or is it nonlinear? Because people say both. And I, as I showed you earlier, we can say some things on it, about it when it comes to the dis dissolution controlled pressure solution, but there is actually not a very big statistical, mechanical, thermodynamic work to be done to, to figure that part out and do it properly. But the, the other part of answering Stefan's question is to figure out what is, what is the role of such types of arrest, like the biological or contact healing, that arrest and changes it, it, changes it in from a viscous to a plastic rheology. And this is com a completely new way of attacking pressure, the total process of pressure solution that has not been done at all yet. Okay, so then I just put up some, some of these mm, questions uh, for the end, which I think go f from more general m how to model geological structures and and, and uh, sediments and and uh, f well on many scales from from the grain scale and up to basin scale and down to fundamental physics like how can we really describe the st stability and evolution of a grain contact under stress thank you